At the outset, let me extend a warm welcome to you to today's briefing. The briefing is being done at the request of the co-facilitators who had reached out to me, suggesting that we do an informal briefing on what transpired at the recently held G20 meetings, in particular, the meeting of finance ministers and central bank governors and the meeting of foreign ministers. Let me also clarify that this briefing is not an alternative to the traditional Sherpa's interaction with member states. We are hopeful that this might be held sooner rather than later. India's G20 presidency comes at a time when the world faces multiple challenges, ranging from climate change and lack of progress in SDGs to the economic slowdown, debt distress, uneven pandemic recovery, food and energy insecurity, and geopolitical conflicts. Yet, in every challenge lies an opportunity. The world is looking at G20 as a ray of hope in providing fresh perspectives and durable solutions to global problems. As Prime Minister Modi had said in the Bali summit, we would like our G20 presidency to be inclusive, ambitious, decisive, and action-oriented. Our G20 logo and the theme reflect this thought with the Earth representing India's pro-planet approach and the Lotus representing growth amidst challenges. Our theme, One Earth, One Family, One Future, reflects our intent to carry all countries with us and leave no one behind. The theme also brings out the value of all life, human, animal, plant, and microorganisms and their interconnectedness. As the fastest growing large economy in the world today, in a largely gloomy global economic scenario, India carries the requisite weight and ability to seek and garner support for quality outcomes. Yet, G20 can work only by consensus, and we have often seen G20 respond better to immediate concerns rather than the long-term challenges. In this context, India as a G7 partner, BRICS and Quad member, SCO and G20 president, and a voice of the Global South, having served recently and successfully as a non-permanent member of the UN Security Council, hopes to serve as a trusted and effective bridge between the developing countries and the advanced economies. Our G20 presidency is India's most high-profile international economic endeavor ever. It is also for the first time that four developing countries, Indonesia, India, Brazil, and South Africa, are presiding over the G20 in a row. In addition to regular G20 participants, we have invited nine more countries, Bangladesh, Egypt, Mauritius, Netherlands, Nigeria, Oman, Singapore, Spain, and the UAE, and 14 international organizations, including the International Solar Alliance and the Coalition of Disaster Resilient Infrastructure, which are both headquartered in India. The G20 summit in New Delhi, scheduled on 9 and 10 September this year, will have the largest ever participation, including from Africa, with six invitees, South Africa, the AU chair, the NEPAD chair, Egypt, Mauritius, and Nigeria. In the run-up to the summit, India will host foreign delegates for around 200 meetings in over 50 cities across the country. During our G20 presidency, we are convening 13 Sherpa track working groups, eight finance track work streams, three initiatives, the RIG, Empower, and SELM, and 11 engagement groups. Over 200 meetings during our presidency will comprise four Sherpa meetings, more than 20 ministerial meetings, four finance deputy meetings, a parliament speaker summit, as well as the Sherpa Track Working Group's Finance Track Workstream meetings chaired at senior official level. All official meetings will culminate in the G20 New Delhi Leaders Summit in September 2023. Our G20 meetings are being held across 56 cities, covering all 28 states and eight union territories of India. We are also working to provide visiting delegates with a unique Indian experience, showcasing India's diversity, inclusive traditions, cultural richness, and strong democratic roots. I will pause here for a minute 
and draw your attention to the fact, and I say so with the greatest humility, uh, the U.S. took its G20 presidency to 12 cities, China to 14 cities, and Indonesia to 25. We are taking it to 56 cities across the length and breadth of the country, from Kashmir in the north to Kanyakumari in the south. Perhaps this is a record in the G20, and I don't think any country in the past has done this, and I doubt, and I say so again with the greatest humility, any other country can achieve this because very few countries have the geographical spread. I can see Francois smiling. <laughs> India's G20 presidency is looking to steer G20's actions towards finding tangible solutions to contemporary global challenges, inspired by an inclusive and human-centric approach aided by the effective use of technology and driven by the need for sustainable development for all. Sharing our story, caring for all, and taking collective action are the key underpinnings of our presidency. Moving very quickly now on to our priorities, some of the key conversations that we are prioritizing in our G20 presidency are as follows. First, green development, climate finance, and a new lifestyle for the environment. Climate action and progress on SDGs are two sides of the same coin. Mobilization of timely and adequate resources for climate finance, including exploring innovative financing, is important to meet climate challenges. There is a need to set a new collective quantified goal from a floor of US dollars 100 billion per year, taking into account the needs and priorities of developing countries. Clean and green transition finance, credit enhancement by multilateral developmental banks through, en through enhancing and expanding their mandate, as well as innovative instruments such as blended finance, viability gap funding, and interest equalization are the need of the hour. Public finance should be used more to leverage the vastly higher amounts of private finance available in the market. At the same time, with growing globalization and easier access to resources, a circular economy and responsible consumption have acquired greater significance. The principles of life or a lifestyle for the environment can be adopted around the world to ensure sustained growth with minimal waste production. From nudging individual and community behavior and responsible consumption and production to sustainable urbanization and the circular economy as a business model, a global pro-planet lifestyle movement. A global pro-planet lifestyle movement holds the key to addressing effectively the multiple challenges of climate change, environmental degradation, energy crises, and rapid sustainable growth. Looking ahead, as perhaps the only large economy with the potential to industrialize without carbonizing, efficiently utilizing large-scale renewable energy, as well as green hydrogen coupled with green ammonia and green shipping, supplemented by technological collaborations and resilient critical material supplies, we aim to set a template for realizing net zero ambitions. Second, accelerated, inclusive, and resilient growth. The challenges faced by our planet can only be addressed with collective resolve, followed by robust action that furthers sustainable growth for all stakeholders. From accelerating progress on SDGs, a focus on the blue economy, and trade for growth to sustain sustainable energy transitions and global food security, our endeavor is to ensure that the G20 serves the long-term interest of all and leaves no one behind. We are at a crucial midpoint, as you all know, of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development adopted in 2015, with cascading and multiple crises threatening a dramatic reversal of progress on the achievement of the SDGs. The SDG financing gap has been widening owing to unfavorable macroeconomic conditions, including record inflation and increasing debt distress. In many ways, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development has got derailed and is in urgent need of rescue. In this context, a robust action plan for achieving SDGs halfway on the road to 2030 is our important priority. Third, 
technological transformation and digital public infrastructure. Developing and harnessing the digital infrastructure will, among other things, define the coming decade. Its use in furthering SDGs and providing easy access to digital payment methods while ensuring data privacy will be crucial and relevant to ensuring a worldwide digital transformation. Digital public infrastructure and platforms, digital health, and tech-enabled development from agriculture to education will be key to harnessing the power of the digital economy to boost growth and development. In particular, we plan to create a common framework, a common framework for digital public infrastructure that outlines the core principles for building DPIs based on a digital identity system, a digital payment system, and an intra-country consent-based data sharing system. Fourth, something that you are very familiar with, multilateral institutions for the 21st century. The world, as we all know, urgently needs reformed and effective multilateral institutions to build resilience and deliver solutions for the pressing and evolving challenges of our time, including developmental challenges, poverty, climate change, disaster risk, pandemics, global food security, international conflicts and crises, and international terrorism. Adapting to the contemporary 21st century realities necessarily requires urgent and comprehensive reform of 21st century institutions to make them more inclusive, representative, and democratic, and to reorient them towards an inclusive, just, and equitable global development agenda. Next, women-led development. Women as entrepreneurs, as members of the work workforce, and as leaders play a critical role in charting the path to the prosperity of all societies. Development led by women, by going beyond women's empowerment and bringing women to the core of economic and professional activities, can provide a real impetus to socio-economic development. Not only should women be empowered more, they should play a strong, equal, and central role in every nation's overall growth. Development can be speedier, more inclusive, and more beneficial when women not only participate, but lead capacity-building institutions. When women engage with equal access, capacity, and agency to take decisions it improves not only their lives, but the lives of their families, communities, and indeed, entire societies. Excellencies, India's G20 presidency has started off well. We've had several important meetings, including the foreign ministers meeting and the meeting of the finance ministers and central bank governors. I would be touching on these two specifically a little later. As the Honorable Prime Minister of India has said, that the chairing by India of the G20 presidency is a reflection of the strength of 140 crore Indians. We are taking the G20 to the people of our country. We are making it a Jan Bhagidari or a people's G20. We are involving the private sector, universities, civil societies, and youth in practical activities and bringing out fresh perspectives thereby on global issues. Now, you might ask me, what has happened so far? Well, so far, in the first three months of our presidency, 11, 11 of the 13 Sherpa track working groups and all finance track work streams have met. Two initiatives, the RIG and Empower, and eight, eight of the 11 engagement groups have held their inception meetings. The first G20 Sherpa meeting the first finance ministers and central bank governors meetings and the G20 foreign ministers meetings have also been held successfully. 18 cities in 14 states and union territories have already hosted G20 meetings. All our official meetings are being held in person and have seen full scale or nearly full scale participation from all G20 members, nine guest countries and 14 plus international organizations. In particular, the finance ministers and foreign ministers meeting saw record in-person participation from all countries with high level dignitaries, 
with 28 foreign ministers and two deputy vice foreign ministers attending the foreign ministers meeting in particular. And I'm happy to say that our broad G20 priorities, which I have earlier outlined, have thus far found wide acceptance from, from amongst the G20 countries and stakeholders. Going forward, we will be further fleshing out common ground and working on specific outcomes. In doing so, we have also emphasized that the G20 is a normative forum and setting the right agenda from a developing country perspective is equally important in itself. Now, very quickly, I'll touch upon the last two meetings. We've held two important ministerial meetings so far, the foreign ministers, the finance ministers meeting, sorry, in Bengaluru last month, and the foreign ministers meeting in New Delhi last week. Both of them concluded with substantive outcomes on a highly diverse range of subjects. Agreed outcome documents were issued at both. At the finance ministers, 15 of the 17 paragraphs, 15 of the 17 paragraphs of the outcome document were fully agreed. And at the foreign ministers meeting, 22 of the 24 paragraphs of the outcome document were fully agreed upon. Barring the complex geopolitical issue of Ukraine, agreement was found on all of them. The G20 foreign ministerial outcome document was the first ever, the first ever in G20. Its key outcomes included endorsement of a shared approach to development cooperation, wherein important principles of international development cooperation, such as host country ownership, equal partnerships, tailoring such cooperation efforts with local needs, transparency and mutual accountability were emphasized. The need for MDBs to mobilize additional financing and additional financing for SDGs was underscored. There was an unequivocal condemnation of terrorism in all its forms and manifestations, and resolve was expressed to counter new and emerging threats and promote counter-narcotics cooperation, including against synthetic drugs. G20 called for a strengthening of efforts to deny terrorist groups safe havens, freedom of operations, movement and recruitment, as well as financial material or political support. The need for reliable food and fertilizer supply chains, as well as resilient and sustainable energy supply chains was stressed. In principle agreement was reached in G20 on global skill mapping. Given the changing nature of work, something that would help forge migration and mobility partnerships going forward, an important priority for developing countries. Emphasis was placed on a cooperative framework for disaster risk reduction. Women empowerment and leadership at the core of efforts for inclusive recovery was recognized. The need for pragmatic and focused discussions on WTO reform, including its dispute settlement mechanism on the path to MC13 was underscored. In the area of health, improved digital health, and affordable medical countermeasures, areas of particular interest to us were also stressed. Again, G20 countries expressed their strong sentiment on the need to strengthen multilateralism in the context of the dramatic changes in the global order. UNGA Resolution 75-1, which called for the reform of the Security Council, revitalizing the General Assembly, and strengthening the ECOSOC was reaffirmed by the G20. In a first, further deepening of cooperation between G20 and African partners, that is, the African Union, was highlighted. With South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt, the EU Chair Comores, Mauritius, and the Auda NEPAD, the Indian Presidency has the highest ever participation from Africa in any G20. In addition, the Finance Minister's outcome document found agreement on the complex issue of a common framework for debt treatment and agreed to set up an expert group on MDB reforms. These are all significant achievements of the G20 in our ongoing presidency. And I will stress that all of the above, all of the above has been achieved despite the challenge of the geopolitical situation, the conflict in Ukraine. The G20 ministers have been able to come to a consensus on addressing the important challenges being faced by the global community. 
The two outcome documents, therefore, are key milestones for our ongoing G20 presidency. The US, the EU, the UK, Japan, Germany, Australia, Mexico, Brazil, and Turkey have welcomed the outcome document, many of them in public. Russia and China also have gone along with their adoption during the finance ministers and the foreign ministers' meetings. Following the Voice of the Global South Summit held earlier this year in January, our agenda also takes forward the priorities of the Global South, some of whom participated as guests in the finance ministers' and foreign ministers' meetings. As regards the Ukraine conflict reference, we will continue to remain closely engaged with all G20 members who have already lent support to the above agreed outcomes to find common ground on its language. Now, finally, you will ask me what lies ahead. Well, the second meeting at the Sherpa level will be held at Kerala at the end of March, specifically 30th March to 2nd April, and the third meeting will be held at Hampi, Karnataka in July 2023. The second finance minister's meeting will be held in Washington, D.C. from 12 to 13 April, alongside the spring meetings of the IMF and World Bank, which are to be held from the 10th to through the 16th of April. And their third meeting will be held in Gandhinagar, Gujarat from 3rd to 4th August 2023 in India. The meetings of the ministers of agriculture, tourism, development, culture, labor and employment, energy, environment and climate, women's empowerment and health will be held through the year before the G20 summit scheduled from 9 to 10 September 2023 in New Delhi. The priorities that India is pursuing as part of its G20 presidency are embedded in various work streams and processes that are underway, as I've already mentioned to you. We are pushing for outcomes and progress in the work of the G20 to seek sustainable solutions for the multiple crises impacting the world, particularly those that are most impacting the global south. Thank you.